Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Kishore Raher. Uh, I'm a solution architect at Google. And I'm here to talk about Kubeflow. And we'll go through the process of building a portable, scalable, and composable uh, platform uh, which can run machine learning algorithms on you know, different kinds of Kubernetes clusters. Uh, before that, fun fact. Does anybody know here why Kubernetes is stylized at K8S? Anybody? Yeah. Eight characters and then S. Do we know on the Kubernetes symbol, there's Helm, there are seven uh, handles or spokes. Do we know why? On the icon of Kubernetes? Okay, uh, anybody, any Star Trek Voyager fan? Awesome. Seven of eight? Oh, seven of nine, sorry, yes. So, uh, Kubernetes is based on an internal uh, framework called BOG. We all know what BOG is, so again, Star Trek Voyager, and that's where it comes from. Okay. So, what is machine learning? Anybody here who have worked on machine learning models, built machine learning models, deployed it? Awesome, very few. So this is great. Let's talk about machine learning. So let's start first with the question. You know, I want to figure out the price of the house in a given market. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna have two axes. On one axis, I'm gonna plot square footage and other the house prices. I'll collect a lot of data. I'll run a linear, a linear regression algorithm, and now I have an answer. Awesome. I wish I can buy a house in that much, but. <laughs> Great, we all are machine learning experts. It's easy, but it's not easy. No machine learning model is that simple. Even when we have to figure out the house prices, there are a lot of dimensions to it. There is like number of rooms, uh, you know, size of the plot, a lot of other dimension, and it is really, really complicated. And when you start building an algorithm, you will see if you start building a rule-based algorithm, it becomes very, very difficult to build a rule-based algorithm. That's why we go to shallow machine learning algorithms or deep machine learning algorithms. So machine learning is a way to solve a problem without explicitly knowing how to create a solution. You know, you throw a lot of stuff at it, and then there you go, there's a solution. Actually, it's not that easy, but I would like to say it that way. Uh, at Google Data Center Ops, you know, our, all our data centers are environmentally friendly, and uh, they ran an experiment. They wanted to make sure the uh, power usage effectiveness, you know, we wanted to make sure that power consumption is based on the usage of our data centers. And we have really, really smart engineers, uh, DevOps, SREs, what we call, and they look at it. They look at every factor. They look at the cooling factor. They look at uh, the air conditioning, in internal temperature, external temperature. They take all of this thing and they basically look at it. They plot it. Then they build a machine learning algorithm to look at all those factors and come up with when to switch on and off basically the uh, power uh, the power units you know the cooling units and there we go they build an algorithm they switched it on and you can see the power consumption went down they switch it off power consumption went down so great now we can do something like that you know we can build a machine learning algorithm which can solve complex problems but it's hard we saw like there are so many factors in it you know, and how do we build it? Where do we run it? Can I do it on my laptop? Can I run it on a cluster uh, in a private cloud? Or maybe Google, why not? Okay, so most folks think it is hard, there's lots of pain, and then there's magic. But why, why, why there's a lot of pain, you know? Because it's all do it yourself, you know? I'm sure in audience, there are some people who will know why it is painful. You know, like you have to type like kubectl, and like thousand times you have to try it, look at your pods, look at your services. We all have done that. So you have to set, set stuff from scratch, integrate with existing legacy systems, and eventually need, uh, you know, migrate 
uh, based on the business needs. You know, when you're building an algorithm, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. You you have some amount of data. You're training it in uh, with certain resources, and now needs change, so you need to move. So you decide, okay, I'm going to go to the hosted uh, cloud provider. Awesome. First five minutes, yes, they give you everything, and then you realize, nah, you have to do everything again when it's machine learning. Plus, you're stuck with a single cloud, you know? And who wants to be stuck with a single cloud here? Is no bias? Okay. So haven't we heard that story? You know, I think, I think we have heard that story and that's why all of us are here because Kubernetes containers are awesome and Kubernetes and containers solve this problem. You know, you can build something which is portable, it can scale and you can move from one cluster to another cluster. You know, you heard like we have awesome Docker container talk in the morning. So you take your container and you deploy it on this cluster or that cluster. Doesn't matter, you have like long YAML file and you just deploy it. And there you go, it works. So in 2017 at Austin, uh, in KubeCon, we announced Kubernetes ex extensibility. Has anybody heard about extensibility of Kubernetes? So basically, when you look at Kubernetes, if you want to do different kinds of projects on it, you may need something new. And you don't need, want to go basically, you know, uh, fork GitHub and change Kubernetes. So it has to be extensible, you know. You should be able to write plugins, platforms by extending Kubernetes rather than changing Kubernetes. And that API was announced then. That means you can do cloud native apps. Have you heard of cloud native apps? Cloud native apps are basically extension to Kubernetes, but they work specifically in the uh, uh, native uh, environment, you know. So, like when you use GKE, that is uh, Google uh, Kubernetes Engine, you have certain extensions which are specific to uh, Google. Uh, other cloud providers also have their extensions. There are a lot of other frameworks, like there's Case on it, there is uh, KPackage, Helm, which are basically extension to Kubernetes. So we need now cloud native ML. Do we agree? I agree. So what are the components of a cloud native ML? That's composability, portability, and scalability. So let's talk about composability. Build a model. Well, it's not that easy, you know. Build a model is a component of composability. But we all know we have to all go through this process. Uh, you have a lot of data, you have to ingest it from somewhere, you know. It's either on the shared drive or, you know, probably on your USB, you have to analyze that data, transform it so that your algorithm can accept it, validate the data, split it for training, validation, and then train the data. Once you train it in a given environment, you might want to scale the training. You have to roll out, you have to serve it, continuously monitor that that model is performing, and uh, when the environment changes, it doesn't give you wrong results, and then log the information. Portability, let's talk about portability. When you talk about portability, there are two aspects of it. If you see, uh, you have compute and uh, compute portability, which is basically your cluster providing you compute portability. So you have uh, CPUs, you have memory, and you have storage. And you will see consistently, this is across the board with all the pu uh, public cloud providers, as well as private cloud providers. But when you talk about machine learning, you're talking about portability with respect to your storage, framework, tooling, UX, and model. You know, like, what frameworks are you using? Are you using TensorFlow? Are you using uh, PyTorch? Are you using XGBoost? Uh, you know, can you take some model off the shelf and train your uh, uh, train it uh, for your use case? Multi-cloud is reality, actually. If you if 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 you see across the board, you know, most of the people are using multi-cloud. Some knowingly, some unknowingly, and I'll get to that knowingly and unknowingly. Uh, big enterprises at least basically use private cloud and one or two public cloud. So portability, there's portability in experimentation, there's portability in training, and there's portability on the cloud. So once something you build which is portable, it should consistently flow through all these stages, you know, what we call them dev staging and prod, or dev UAT and prod. 
that doesn't matter to me does anybody think this doesn't matter to you okay you're wrong why so joe beda he said the way i think about it every dif difference between dev staging prod will eventually re result in out outage dev let's focus on dev do we know where our dev is that's on our laptop you know so we do a lot of experimentation on our laptop and we need to make sure that it's consistent environment where you build something on your laptop and you can port it to a private cloud or a public cloud so that's the space where you are doing your work in laptop scalability when we talk about scalability we are talking about lot of things you know we are talking about accelerators uh, gpus tpus we are talking about you know scalability in with respect to cpus uh disk and networking skill sets you know like uh data engineers you know machine learning engineers uh devops they all have different skill sets and we need to have tools which can be used with all of these skill sets uh teams across experiments you know different experiment needs different kinds of skill sets so when we look at all these things you know what really good at all these three things again containers and kubernetes except you want to do machine learning so now you have to become an expert who is expert in all of this someone right someone here who is expert in all of these things so now in order to do machine learning you need to know all of these things you know or you need to have a team who knows all of these things enter kubernetes 0.1 basically we are trying to solve these problems using kubeflow 0.1 makes it easy for everyone to develop deploy and manage uh, portable distributed machine learning uh, on kubernetes so now we're going to replace the compute model with kubernetes and we're going to replace all the other on the top framework tooling uh, ux with kubeflow and that's what is going to give us portability and scalability and composability what's in the box so we had awesome talk about uh, jupiter hub it's in the box we have multi framework model serving so you can build your model in uh, tensorflow uh, tensorflow or you can build uh, build and serve your model with uh, pytorch sheldon there are a lot of other frameworks coming in uh, you have a lot of examples you can go to kubeflow.org uh, and you can see these examples and kesonet for package managing uh, has anybody heard of kesonet no awesome who likes to write yaml <laughs> anybody big yaml files awesome so that means this is the audience for kesonet so kesonet is basically what you can do is you can write it, it it's based on jsonet which is like json based declaration file and you can do templating so once you have your template ready you can create the yaml on the fly by uh, generate it by passing parameters right so you can have your template and you can say i need more cpus i need more G gpus i need uh, to point it to this uh, container or the other container and it will generate everything for you and deploy it so makes life easy uh, there are other packages by the way helm is for complete deployments uh, there is kpa k package or uh, that's also for the similar use case so you should look into it so in 1.0 what we cover is all these things you know we cover training model building uh, validation training at scale serving and monitoring demo time so i'm using something called as demo magic so it will feel like i'm typing very fast but i'm not and this is not a video so very important to declare this variable so i'm going to use one x version i'm going to make sure i'm pointing at the right config there's nothing deployed right now it's just kubernetes now i'm basically initializing a kesonet folder it's blank and i want to install kubeflow in it so i will create a kesonet environment 
And to the case at registry, I am pointing it to the Kubeflow. Now again, there are a lot of other packages available. You should go and look at it. It's very interesting. Uh, I will point it to Kubeflow. And now I'll start installing uh, one by one the packages within Kubeflow. There are a lot of packages, but I'll install three. There is core, TF serving, that is TensorFlow serving. You have TF job. So basically, if you want to run scalable uh, jobs, this is the package. This is the step where I basically take everything, take all the parameters, generate the template, and apply it. Cross your fingers, demo guards. Worked. Awesome. You're going to look at it. So now, there we go. So from start to end, we deployed the whole Kubeflow, services, pods. You can see there is TF Hub, uh, which is basically your Jupyter Hub deployed. You have job operator where you can submit the jobs and you have uh, dashboards. All of it is available. Going back, so where's the data? Well, actually, Kubeflow supports app portability, not data portability. There's some awesome uh, uh, software which is available to do that. I think I heard one new one like Zeph today. Uh, there is uh, Elastifile, which is also available, which is enterprise grade across the uh, cloud uh, scalability with respect to your data. So you can have your data and you can go from different clouds and access that data uh, easily. So we spoke about Kubeflow. Uh, Point one. Now let's talk about Kubeflow 0.2. This is the current version. Uh, it's basically new. It supports uh, PyTorch. Again, another framework like Kubeflow. Uh, sorry, like uh, TensorFlow. Uh, Katib. I, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's for hyperparameter tuning. Uh, does everybody know hyperparameter tuning? No. So when you have a machine learning model, you have uh, parameters like learning rate, uh, you know, and uh, your batch size, and all this impacts uh, your model accuracy. And it's what I call it like voodoo magic science. So there's science, and then there's voodoo and magic, where you don't know what numbers to change, but something is going to give you a right result. And you can sit there and do it day in and day out, and one day you will find your results. Or you can use a hyperparameter trainer, which will basically change these parameters, run your ma model, look at your accuracy, you know, rinse and repeat again and again and get you the right result at the best accuracy. And, and you have frameworks like this, there's H2O, which we'll talk about. And this is based on uh, Google internal project, which was called Wiser. Uh, so you can use it for hyperparameter training. A lot of platform integration. Again, you can, you have a lot of external companies which have their products, they have integrated using Kubeflow and simplified getting started. So. Let's look at advanced features. Now, we want Kubeflow to be like a platform. So you have your Kubernetes, you have your Kubeflow over it, and then you, one of the, again, H2O is a hyperparameter tuning framework. You want it overlaid on that. It should be as easy as you should not be writing any code when you want to do all these things. So once you have deployed Kubeflow or, and or these frameworks within your environment, your data engineer should be able to come in without even understanding anything about like cluster, networking, parts, services, they should be able to submit their jobs and execute it. We spoke about this again, uh, but I like the dashboard, so why not have it there? Uh, again, PyTorch, we saw, we executed this for TensorFlow. If I were to have PyTorch, which is another framework, and I just wanted to show this thing because it's, although, uh, Google has written it and open source it. That doesn't mean we don't want to support uh, other frameworks. You just change one line of code, and there you go. Now you can have PyTorch-based code deployed on Kubeflow. Uh, platform integration. So this is one of the amazing features. When you look at platform integration, what does it mean? Different cloud providers, or even your private cloud, have different kind of security infrastructure. Uh, different cloud providers will have different accelerators available. You know, uh, uh, I know we have preempt, uh, preemptive VMs. Uh, 
uh, what we do is basically it's like uh, the VM, which is like very, very uh, cost effective, but we can take it any time. So if you are running a huge job uh, of MapReduce or something like that, you can use those VMs. They are very cost effective. And even if you lose them, you don't really lose when it's a large cl a cluster. So what platform integration does is you have the front end APIs, which are common across the board, but back end implementation is uh, implemented by the basically the natively. So Azure or you know any other provider will have their own implementation, which is native implementation. But as a user, you don't have to worry about it. TPU acceleration, uh, I think I had to bring this slide in Kubeflow because it's uh, very interesting and uh, something which I work on. Uh, it is very important. Now, if I, I've, I've built huge machine learning models and sometimes it takes like 40, 45 days to train a model. Uh, really, it does take that long on like a uh, lot of GPUs, right? Uh, I've done like P100, like eight GPUs, takes long time. There comes like, you know, a uh, special purpose uh, hardware, which is TPU, which can basically accelerate this uh, training process. So when you look at like uh, image processing, you can basically uh, uh, process 900,000 images per second uh, on a non-TPU machine uh, was vis-a-vis -vis 1.7 million images uh, on a TPU per second. By the way, if you have any questions, please stop me anytime. It's not too late. We have still a few more slides to go. And uh, in order to reach 75% accuracy, uh, on a non-DPU infrastructure, you will spend at least $129. Uh, on a TPU, you will be spending uh, somewhere around $55. So today, IT ops has a lot of stuff to do. At least I believe this audience agrees with that, right? There's a lot to manage. There's you know, huge clusters, a lot of infrastructure. But data scientists, they just want to build their model and they need these six nodes. ID Ops is like, okay, we'll get to it. Once I have time, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. And data scientists will wait. And there we go. ID Ops will assign six nodes. And data scientist uh, says, thanks, lots of work, and they are done. What happens now? If they don't communicate with each other, what happens? We leave those nodes on. Uh, if you are on a public cloud, of course it's gonna cost you. If you are on a private cloud, it is gonna cost you in a different way. Of course, a power usage, uh, other people cannot use these nodes. So there's dollar amount to it. So what do you do? Kubeflow provides, again, TF job, there is another framework also available. What it will do is it will on the fly allocate your resources and when the job is done, it will take away those resources and clean it up. So you don't have to worry. Your data scientist just has to write uh, YAML, which we all love, uh, and say I need six replicas, one CPU, one GPU, and this is the uh, container image which you should use. And there we go, uh, give it to TF job, operator and it will execute it and run the job and get you results and clean it, clean it up afterwards. And we don't have to worry about the cost. And simplified setup, very important. So as I showed you in the previous version, we had like at least uh, six uh, commands to fire and we used to love uh, kubectl, now we have to love uh, ksonet, so you know, we have to learn all these commands. Well, not really. You can do it in two lines, technically. So let's run it. So this time, I'm gonna deploy a Kubeflow point two on GKE cluster, okay? This is 2.2 version. Of course, I need to make sure my uh, kubectl is pointing to my cluster. Just to make sure nothing is deployed, it is gonna be a little bit slow uh, compared to on my laptop. There we go. So 
So remember, we just deployed three things. The script will deploy everything. If you don't want everything, you can go into deploy.sh and comment out the packages which you don't want to deploy within your cluster and just leave everything else as is and there we go. Just deployed Kubeflow on GKE cluster. So, so far what we didn't talk about, we didn't talk about any bespoke solution, uh, nothing cloud specific and we are not forking uh, Kubernetes, you know, nobody likes to go and download GitHub code of Kubernetes and change it. Some people do, but not all of us. Uh, what is the momentum? Uh, we are talking about at least 1000 plus commits. We have 100, uh, community, 100 plus community contributors and we have 20 plus companies. You can see all those companies. Uh, Heptio is a, a big contributor. We have uh, Google, that's us. Uh, you have Jupyter. You have Microsoft, Red Hat, Sheldon. Everybody's contributing to this framework. So it's a whole new world. Data science is touching everything, everywhere. And everybody cannot become a PhD in statistics to do data science. We want to help everyone. We want to make sure this is accessible to everyone and take advantage of this framework. Uh, let's give this to people who are not in this room, but everybody else. Make it so easy that they all can use it. Uh, point three is uh, coming up in weeks. By weeks, I mean at least like eight weeks or nine weeks uh, uh, from now. And it has hyperparameter tuning jobs without writing any code. Uh, job operator APIs, which is a uh, uh, standard API across the board. So even if, even though you use different frameworks, it, it will be a standard API and uh, more platforms with uh, click to deploy. So eventually we want to reach in a stage where you can uh, write your papers uh, and you can have a package, a case on it package, which is ready to be deployed uh, on Kubeflow and Kubernetes and nobody has to worry. People can read these uh, uh, papers and download that code and regardless of what infrastructure they are on, they should be able to deploy and get running with that uh, package. So it's open community, open design, open source, open to ideas. We want a lot of ideas. We want to create new platforms. So please help us build this platform. That's the website, GitHub, uh, Slack channel, Twitter. You have two product managers, uh, David uh, Aranchik and Christopher Cho. You can directly contact them if you have any ideas. Uh, you can contact me. We, I have my colleague uh, Karan here. You can contact him. And one more thing, I think a lot of people in audience uh, uh, asked about uh, GKE on-prem. So I'm just gonna finish up with this slide. GKE on-prem is as good as running GKE uh, on basically on-prem. And what we call it this is as edge uh, Kubernetes. And what it gives you is it gives you the whole GKE, what we have on the cloud infrastructure on-prem. And then you can have a single dashboard. You know, you can look at all these uh, control using single dashboard, all these clusters, GKE clusters, which also if you are a Google uh, customer, you can integrate it with Google Cloud. And through single dashboard, you can look at all these edge uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters. So that's what is GKE on-prem. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time. Do, do you have time for questions? Yeah, we... sure. Questions for Kishore. I actually didn't hear much that was machine learning specific about your, uh, your framework. It seems like uh, any sort of our mass data processing uh, uh, analysis that's in research could be marshaled in this sort of a structure. Is there, is there anything that, that would um, keep the focus narrowed in on machine learning solutions or are you thinking more broadly? Uh, we are thinking more broadly. Again, as I said, we are uh, open to ideas. If, for example, the operator which I showed, TF operator, uh, that's very specific to like TensorFlow or, or basically PyTorch operator will be specific to PyTorch uh, framework. Now, uh, you can write any kind of like mathematical uh, uh, software on TensorFlow, right? Uh, so it doesn't limit to machine learning AI, but any other kind of you know, linear algebra based problems can be solved uh, at a scale. Uh, 
you know so that's one use case but we are open to other ideas you know if, if it fits into a, a space where you have you have you want to automate the scalability right like submit it to a job and don't worry the job will take care of it and, and job is very specific to the frameworks you are using so if you have any other framework and idea which is like uh, math based sure why not we are open to those ideas engineering codes there's there's lots of uh, of these kinds of codes where you're doing thousands or tens of thousands or millions of parameter scans that that look like they would map very well onto this framework I think there's, there's two there, there are two things right so one is this type of framework and then this then, then there's this framework yeah. this framework is really focused on machine learning so if you look at the packages that are available they are the packages that are available are going to be focused on uh, supporting machine learning uh, uh, packages. Now, the same idea, and by the way, some some of the packages are there. There's a there's a big overlap. I mentioned you know um, Borboth, which is a, a distributed training machine learning training uh, package that uses MPI for communication across the nodes. So now uh, now we're getting into you know really traditional HPC. Uh, uh, use cases, and I think some an approach like Kubeflow for HPC related jobs. There have been a couple attempts uh, at, uh, for example, replacing the standard Kubernetes uh, scheduler with a grid scheduler. Right, uh, Unova did this uh, called NavOps, and I don't think that it got a lot of traction uh, in the in in the marketplace. But but once you can start. Uh, Composably building these packages together, you're right. The workflows are very, very similar, uh, and the, the the kinds of technologies that are used, the types of analysis are very similar. So it is very interesting. Great. The other question. Now I have help, so I can take more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we happy to take more more questions, uh, and I also um, we we have. The uh, product manager for Kubeflow, uh, who is in Singapore, and uh, so it's like uh, 5:30 a.m. yesterday or tomorrow. I can't remember. Um, but uh, he he uh, he wanted to uh, just talk to you guys a little bit about reproducibility uh, as part. Uh, so he's the product manager for the open source uh, project, and um, so we're going to kind of bridge him into into this. And maybe while I'm setting up, if there's other questions. He sure can handle those. Or maybe fun facts. So one of the things that we've done uh, in partnership with Internet2 uh, is, uh, is provide uh, uh, data egress waivers for the academic community. So if your institution is a Internet2, uh, you know, has an Internet2 contract, then um, you can uh, get that as well. We're, we're not trying to uh, lock, you, lock your data in. But one of the other things that we do, and the other, I think some of the other cloud vendors might do this too, is provide tools for. Uh, so now you can host data in the cloud, but of course, if there, if if people come and get that data, they you you might be charged, uh, you know, egress waivers, right, or egress uh, pricing for that. So there's there's a certain risk in in putting that up there. So what we have is uh, we have something called requester pays. Uh, GCS buckets. So that way you can put the data up and you can provide it for free uh, to your collaborators or to the people within your project, but other people who come and want to uh, want to access that data, that's fine, but they get billed for it. You don't get billed for it. 
So uh, we're, we're, we're building in those capabilities because uh, you know, we understand how, value, how important those, those are to uh, this community. Uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, Christopher Cho, who's already up on the screens. And uh, uh, Chris, I'm sorry you can't see them, but they are all seeing you at in. Uh, the, you, you're, you're in two screens, about uh, 20 feet high. Yeah. And um, let me can you say something. Let me let's see if you, we got the audio working. Well, this makes me uh, very nervous because uh, I can't see them, but they can see me in a large uh, screen at 6:30 in the morning. So interesting. Oh wow, look at that. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this is great. Uh, okay, so uh I, I heard I heard some questions. Uh how, how should I go about this? So just uh, start talking and then I guess you're gonna put the slides up. You know, oh. uh so I can only do you or the slides. Uh so why don't oh, you talk right? and then um and then we'll go back to the slides. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Chris. I'm one of the PMs for Qflow. Uh, I joined uh, Qflow project about, uh, I guess, beginning of this year after it was announced. Uh, I really loved the vision of making machine learning uh, easy for uh, you know one of the most important communities uh, in the world, in my opinion. Uh, we like the data scientists and the researchers. Uh, I think you know this is one of those fields that can be applied in uh, a lot of different other uh, other knowledge sectors or science science uh, areas. So I'm really excited for this project. And my responsibility uh, is is to extend the capability of Qflow and explore how we can use Qflow in science community. So before I joined Google Cloud, I used to work at DeepMind. And uh, you know, in DeepMind, one of the problems uh, that I was helping to solve was exactly this problem internally as well. Uh, we had this team called a Research Platform Team, uh, which their whole their job we had uh, quite a number of engineers dedicated to building infrastructure for research. And when I was looking at the uh, the outside of DeepMind community, uh, I I didn't see many tools that are out there that makes uh, science. Uh, easily reproducible. So when I saw Kubeflow, uh, it was you know, one of those things that just kind of clicked and that it makes sense to uh, use uh, containers, Kubernetes, uh, and TensorFlow, and any other libraries that are commonly used to make it easy for uh, researchers to reproduce. Um, this might be a good time to maybe uh, throw up the slides if you don't mind. Is that okay? Yeah, one sec. No worries. Okay, you got you got slide number your your first slide. Oh, what happened? Hang on, hang on one sec. One sec. Okay, go ahead. Okay, no, he's, he's he's good. Yeah, so reproducible research for science. Uh, so I, I think for me, like it needs to start with the people in this room uh, that has, you know, I highlighted the words the scientists because um, it's one of those things that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure people understand how important uh, reproducibility is in science uh, because uh, one of my backgrounds that I'd like to share uh, real quick was, um, so I grew up in Korea. And there's this uh, scientist that was working on um, a cloning application. And basically, the world was uh, you know, very excited about this research. And um, because you know, he was publishing results, and they, hey, like, we can finally clone animals and you know, do all this uh, you know, like sci-fi stuff. But nobody was able to like, test it until later. Now, it's not quite exactly like the machine learning, but I think the same principle applies. There are a lot of machine learning, re uh, machine learning papers and other types of computation-heavy uh, papers that are coming out. Uh, but as I'm talking to many different scientists and researchers in different organizations, I'm finding out that it is very difficult to reproduce e uh, other people's work and actually even your own work, like I say, like a year ago. Um, so I was talking to um, Ian Goodfellow from Define about how to reproduce some of his papers from 
uh, a year ago, and then you know he was telling me that it was it, it's hard to do. Uh, and, and this is your own work, and I, I don't know if you guys have a similar experience, but I, I'm, my hypothesis is that you guys experience something similar. So uh, if you can go to the next slide for me, please. Yep, go ahead. And I just took this from Wikipedia. Uh, if you look at scientific method and put it in linearly, it looks kind of like this. And the vis vision for me is to accelerate research of velocity. Uh, if you go to the next slide. And I think it's this step, step number four and eight, uh, where I think Qflow can really help. Right, because uh, one, two, and three is, you know, smart people like you guys uh, come up with hypothesis and then start thinking about a good way to approach and performing experiment, collecting data in a rep reproducible manner, packaging it, uh, analyzing data, interpret, publish, and also be able to retest those results, I think is important for research. Uh, so I would love to get your involvement and help. We're still in the very early stages to uh, identify the exact problem and the how-to of applying Qflow in the research community. Uh, this is also uh, very important for not just machine learning, but for other areas that use any type of computation uh, or libraries that can be packaged uh, as a container. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Yep, you're there. Uh, so my ask is that uh, one thing that we would like to explore is to partnering with us as a Qflow team and Google um, to publish a paper with Qflow. Uh, so we, we have engineers that are interested in this problem. Uh, I am very interested and the community in Google is also very interested uh, in working with external researchers to understand what your pain points are exactly and how to solve it. And we would love to get some volunteers to work with us on actually publishing papers with us. Um, and the second one is to participate in user research. So, you know, if uh, partnering with us to publish in your paper isn't your jam, if you can spare one hour uh, just to sit with me and Maggie, uh, who is our uh, user experience researcher, uh, just to spend some time with us to understand your pain points so that we can uh, learn about the community, the pain points, and how to solve it using Qflow uh, or even evolving Qflow in a way that it, it actually fits the uh, the problem is something that will be very, very valuable for the team. Uh, and obviously, when you, you participate, you, know, you get you know, little incentives like free, free uh, cloud credits, or I'm not sure what else they get, but they, they give us some cool stuff. Uh, so I would highly encourage you uh, to you know, at least sign up for the user research. Um, that's all I have at the moment. Uh, I guess, uh, should I take questions? Uh, I don't know how much time you guys have left. Uh, I think we're we're running out of time, um, but uh, uh, the um, oh okay. So we do have time. So if if anybody has questions for Chris, happy to uh, to to address them. His this is his email address. We'll make sure that the slides uh, go out to the to the organizers, so everybody uh, has a copy of this as well, uh, and and the, the the various links. And any questions for Chris? Hang on, Sean. <laughs> uh, I actually wonder, uh, what's your approach dealing with this uh, reproducible problem? Because uh, as I understand it, if you have a complex machine learning models, potentially can millions of parameters, right? Then uh, usually when you start with that, you use a random number generator, then you do gradient descent, but since, uh, since the reason you cannot produce, you have different random generators, so you have different initial conditions. So you, you might, not, might not be able to have the same results when you run it for the second time. But, uh, but then it's not trivial, right? To, to, uh, since you're using random, it's not trivial to, to initialize all millions of parameters. So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, how would you solve this problem? Chris, did you uh, hear the question? I did, yeah, Then that's exactly right. It's, it is not trivial, and that's why we need to find out what the exact problems are. And what you're describing there is only actually one facet of the whole problem. Uh, there are other problems uh, that I'm realizing uh, as I'm talking to more people, is that if you want to reproduce, yes, we have those parameters that you have to set. Uh, in addition, access to the data, 
what the code looks like and being able to make that transparent. Uh, but also there's tendency uh, that I've seen from the scientists like reproducibility is great until you have to you know, make your own code reproducible for other people. Uh, and there's like a lot of different ways and uh, you know, that I'm learning about this problem. And what you're, I, I think what you just highlighted is definitely one of those things. And uh, we don't have a clear answer at the moment. And you know, I'm, I'm writing this down uh, as you're speaking as one of those things that we need to figure out. Uh, so we'd love to talk to you and kind of uh, detail in if you're interested in working with us and kind of uh, you know, any of those concerns. That, you know, we, I'm not a researcher uh, by trade, I worked with researchers, so I understand the population a bit. Uh, but you know, we want to understand your problem. So yeah, please uh, speak to us. Other questions? Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Christopher, um, and thank you all for uh, trying this experiment, pulling in people from uh, literally all the way on the other side of the world. Uh, so thanks, Chris, and uh, your email address. We'll go to everybody, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get some volunteers. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.